I mentioned <laughs> that we're really happy to have UCS uh, working on our site so regularly and in intentionally and um, sharing so much of your knowledge um, as an Indigenous plant diva um, and an interdisciplinary artist uh, working on so many different projects in, in the region and um, we're really blessed to have you and um, I'll let you um, do a little intro to the, what people are going to see today. Oh, I think I have to unmute you. There you go. Hatsquile, eh, Tanoya, Kwitz Danat, Quien, Quen Shaman, Sis Quen Sna, Anwanat, Stan So, good morning, everybody. I hope you're all having a good day. Uh, I probably from all kinds of places we don't even know yet. Um, but here in the West Coast, in the unceded lands of the Tsleil-Waututh and the Omashult and the Homakliam, we are in uh, our version of winter. <laughs> I always feel like we're such wimps. Get a millimeter of snow for a few days and it's gone. But the cold air is still out there and we're reminded by uh, the birds how important it is for these seasonal changes because they as little creatures endure so much more than humans do, so much more. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm gonna be sharing uh, once a month, I'll be doing a monthly plant profile and I focus on three plants and we're you know, gonna be doing as many of the ones on the site as we can so that people can get a good idea of what to expect on the site and also what they're going to find around the Pacific Northwest coast at this time. So yeah, so I believe that uh, our lovely Nicole is going to be facilitating bringing that video we just shot yesterday. And um, I'm going to apologize to any language professionals out there. I navigated my way through my broken Skolmish Snachem learning that is not completely on par, but I'm doing my best. So uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's hard to, to learn a language when you're older, but anyway, it's, um, I'm doing my best and I tried to get the proper names in Skomish and Latin and in English so that, you know, it just continues to encourage people to learn uh, different names of plants when you're cross-referencing and wanting to know exactly what you're looking at. So here we go. Perfect, thank you so much, Cease. And yeah, just to, to kind of hop on that, um, we have uh, recorded this video yesterday at the flats. Um, so all these plants can be found um, at the Maplewood Flats and I think that is absolutely awesome. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen again, um, just take a few seconds. Um, so just, yeah, all right. I just got to share my sound. Perfect. Shared. Okay. I'm just going to go. Okay. Can everyone see this? I'm asking Leanne, are you able to see this? Okay. Perfect. Hasquile, Ech Tanoya, Twitstanat, Quien Quen Shaman, Sis Quien Sna. So here I am to do a monthly uh, plant profile and I'll do three uh, every section that we do. And we're gonna start with the snowberry, which is also known as Sympho Symphoricarpus albus. And so, okay, now I'm gonna attempt Skoomish Nechum. So I'll try that again. And that's the snowberry. And so the snowberry is a really fun plant. Um, you'll see it bobbling. Often in the wind, if there's a bunch, you'll see them bobbling. It's very great uh, bird food. Really want to emphasize how growing indigenous foods feeds your environment. You don't have to buy bird seed. You don't have to do a lot of things. And it's the safest way to, to actually feed the birds. It is also the best way to feed the local pollinators. So this one is at the end of its season almost. We're going into uh, <laughs> spring. I'm getting poked. This, the snowberry loves me. It's just like touching me everywhere and saying, hey, I love you. Now it's in my mouth. Just decided to jump in there, <laughs> but I'm okay with that because I, I love plants so much. 
So I'm gonna demonstrate something really fun about this plant as I put my phone down. That's my cheat sheet I'm using. So here we go and I'll take a couple of these. I don't want to take all of them. Oh, some fell down, but the good thing is they're all full of seeds and they'll grow more. So here I am and I'm gonna keep doing this as if I was putting hand sanitizer on and then keep rubbing that, rubbing it and rubbing it till my hands are dry. And what I've just done is work on healing the nerves in my hands that get damaged from different things. And that's the medicine of this plant. So we don't eat it, but the birds do. And when we do that, good to do it outside or collect whatever you rubbed off of yourself and put it back into the forest because it's filled with seeds. And those seeds will bring forth more. And it's a wonderful winter berry that we get to see throughout the Pacific Northwest coast. And uh, some people call it ghost berry because it's white, but also because it could, it could kill you. So we don't eat them. We just use them externally. And I really love showing kids how to use that. And they, they get right into it. They put one in their hand and they rub and they rub. And it really, yeah. Oh, and here we have a little friend. Oh! <laughs> my, my tiniest student yet. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna move on to another plant and it's actually right next to this one. Just so much fun. And again, it's a berry plant and there are tiny little buds coming out. Okay, and so this one here is the High Mountain Huckleberry, also known as Vaccinium ovatum. And there are several types of vacciniums on the Pacific Northwest coast from Alaska all the way down into uh, probably Northern California. And you find vacciniums all over the world. So it's a very exciting plant. This one is quite a bit different than the Pacific Northwest Coast Huckleberry, which we'll talk about later in the spring when we start to see leaves and buds as well. But I figured because this is winter, I want to talk about plants that are really thriving in the winter time. Um, and what is really interesting about this one is that the little berries grow so close together, it's like they grow in clumps, but like all vacciniums, you get one at a time. And there you can see the little red dots near my fingers. So those are all gonna produce uh, berries that are quite tiny. So about finger to finger this big, almost as big as the leaves, just tiny little berries. And when you grab them, you pull them in a clump and hopefully have your berry basket underneath to catch them, any that fall. And uh, so delicious. It's like pockets of health and wellness because uh, as the name implies vaccinium vaccines uh, prevent illnesses so do wild berries and so the vacciniums the huckleberries do that they're also brain food so if you're having trouble remembering things go get some blueberries they're also a vaccinium and another vaccinium is also cranberries so you can see that they're one of the healthiest berries on the Pacific Northwest coast. And this one, we would have had to go to the high mountains to gather or to trade with people from Stadlium and uh, the Seelk and the Shikwetan people. These would grow in their territories. So it's not actually from here. It doesn't grow technically within the Skomish uh, lands and waters, but we had what we call berry trails and we we would travel back and forth and trade with uh, other nations so now this one is one that we get to grow here and gather and i personally get very excited about them and love them so yeah that's this one and uh so i'm gonna take an attempt on the names here <laughs> you'll have to be patient with me so the closest I could come, I don't want to say that this is the word, I'm going to do some research, but in all the types of vacciniums I looked at, this one was the closest to this particular vaccinium. And it uh, says, My mouth is just doing aerobics. 
also known as black huckleberry or evergreen huckleberry and vaccinium ovatum. So yeah, great to have in your in your yard. It, fill, it stays green all year long and it feeds all the pollinators and it feeds all the birds and it feeds the humans. So we're in there too. <laughs> okay. Um, and is everyone able to hear this one too? Okay, I'm gonna assume so. <laughs> so here we are with uh, Kinnick Kinnick, also known as Arctostophilus uva ursi. And then I'm gonna attempt this, Equini, Equini. And so this, uh, is a very low growing plant. I'll get down here. So you can see that it likes to grow and creep along the ground and that's why it's often used as a ground cover like it is right here. And the highest you're ever going to see it get is about this high, which is about almost up to my knee. I'll show that. Which is up halfway up my shin. And so this is a plant that as I said, likes to grow close to the ground and that's usually how you're gonna find it. The branching goes, spreads out and it keeps growing. And the leaves are used for a number of things. One of the uses is indigenous tobacco. So we didn't have nicotine tobacco here on the Pacific Northwest coast, but we had this kinnikinnik and other plants we'll explore as we go through the months. And another thing that is amazing about this plant is that it helps to uh, heal bladder infections. And so when drinking it as a tea, just a small amount, like the amount that's in my palm of my hand right here is the most you'd need. And you would throw that into a pot with maybe two cups of water, cover that and simmer for about an hour, hour and a half covered, and then drink it. You drink that about three times a day. So if you have two cups, you could drink, you could make the two cups last you through the day and just drink about a third of a cup three times a day. And over the next five days, I always say five to 10 days, that will heal your bladder infection. It also has the capability of helping to heal bladder cancer. So this is a really good one to know and it's also a good one to grow and we're going to look at a couple of the berries that are on there another nickname for this plant which is comes out in the latin name is bear berry so you can see the nice little bears berries on there that bears actually eat that's why it's called bear berry and this one uh is one that we've used you can eat the berries every Thing is edible on there but uh, palatable I can't guarantee although with the berries if you mesh them ma mash them up with other berries they would have a better flavor it's really good medicine and um, the another thing we've used is actually to adorn ourselves by sowing the berries when they're fresh and then they start to uh, look like little beads as they dry so when we look at very old regalia in museums, we often see these berries on things. Where did they get them? And because Kinnick Kinnick, just like wild rose, grows all over North America. So it's found in different climates. It really loves acidic soil. So it likes to grow around pine trees and other coniferous trees. And uh, yeah, we're gonna talk more as we go through the year about plants and have more information about plant guilds and uh, the environments that plants like to coexist with each other in so that eventually we encourage people to have uh, indigenous food forest gardens in their yards or on their patio, whatever works. OCM. Awesome, okay. 
So thank you everyone for watching that video. Thank you, Cease, um, who came to the flats yesterday to film that. It's always nice um, <laughs> when we can, you know, show um, the plants in real life, right? So I, I always love that. Um, and yes, I think uh, Carlene Thomas wrote in the chat, um, yes, I want a garden like that. Me too, <laughs> me too. Um, so, <laughs> so Cease, I'll definitely let you pass it off if you wanted to add anything from those videos. Um, I did. I do have photos that I can share um, with everyone here of each plant. If we want to zoom in, I, I got some of them with the berries, um, the huckleberry. So I can do that. Oh, what a cute baby! <laughs> um, Lift that baby up. You can only see the baby's head. Oh, there we go. Oh my goodness! All right, utter cuteness. So cute. <laughs> so cute. Um, and so, yeah, so I have that. And then, um, yeah, we can also open up the floor to questions in a little bit as well, um, whatever you feel comfortable with, Cease. Sure. Um, yeah, so why don't you uh, throw up a picture of the black huckleberry so that Perfect. people can get a bit more about it and I can kind of talk while it's up. That's awesome. Okay, give me one sec. I've been exploring ways of where can I put my iPad so it doesn't fall down and it's on the mantle so I'm close to the fire and it's keeping me warm. So here we go. Look at these luscious berries and they actually get even darker than that. They, these ones are blue, but they actually turn black, mm -hmm. which is quite amazing. And they're so delicious. And like all the vacciniums, they have little crowns you can see. They have all the features that you see in blueberries, huckleberries, um, all the, the different types of vaccinium. So it's something to note. Uh, <laughs> I have often been seen in places where I find them. So here, these ones are almost ripe. You can see how dark they're getting and that luscious little crown and the different colors of the different stages, how they're green. And so, you know, um, they're just wondrous berries and the you know, and I think they're well named. Vaccinium is a really appropriate name. These berries are quite tiny. And uh, when you eat them, oh, look at that beautiful basket filled with them. So when you're eating them, you uh, crunch down and uh, it releases a pocket of juice. And depending on how ripe they are, they could be kind of sour to sweet. And then you get the little tiny seeds that roll around in your body and especially through your intestines and they loosen things up often things that have possibly been there for years and years uh yeah it's a true thing berries do amazing work look at those they're so dainty and like i said they look like they're in clumps but they grow one at a time and along the branch there and because they're so tiny you can just kind of grab them and kind of pull them towards you and um, always have a little bucket underneath or a basket so you can gather those up and, you know, and, uh, and go along and, and get, get your treasures, bring them home, make some jam. You can dry them and have them throughout the winter to eat as dried berries. So I think traditionally the biggest thing that was done with them is drying them individually as well as making berry cakes and um, yeah. So um, I, like, as I said, they're one of my favorite berries and reviewing that again, the juice, which is like quite often the same color as your uh, blood. So they're good for your blood. And then the seeds, if you were able to look at them, most people would have to use a magnifying glass. I would, <laughs> or really good glasses because they're quite tiny. They're like little tiny dots and but looking close to them, you can see, you end up seeing that they're, you know, a combination of yellow and red. And so it talks that that's a tonic um, indicator that it works on everything in your body because your body has yellow fluids and red fluids. And so when we're attracted to plants that have uh, these colors, that's what we use to heal ourselves with. So, yeah. Um, you can go back yeah. to particular. Yeah, um, I was just going to say, Carlene did ask in the um, chat, um, do you know the Squamish word or can you repeat the Squamish word? Um, oh, yeah, that was the Squamish word I found and I'll try to say it again. <laughs> Making me work. <laughs> oh, okay. then I said, never mind. I, thought, I was oh. wondering if, 
if they're called dacha berries. Oh, I'll call them dacha. I well, see here, that. I'll hold up my phone, and if you want to put it onto regular screen, I can put it on my screen and um, just go a little bit to the to the other side. Uh, other side, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Does that help? Oh, I go back towards your uh, face. If that makes any sense. Yeah. I can play the video too again of the pronunciation, if that's okay. Oh, that's well, okay. That's I'll okay, I'm good. Do my best. Um, it's spelled X-W-I -I with an accent, X-W-I -I regular, K-W with, with an accent. And so uh, the I's are pronounced like A's, like a hard A. And um, yeah, and Parlene, they're the ones right outside the nature house. And if you wanted to order some, I'm sure we can get some for you from the, uh, the nursery. We're also planning to plant a bunch of these outside of the Tislewa uh, offices because of their hardiness and ability to, to grow in many places. There we go. Thanks, nice. Nicole, for putting that up. Or I don't know if that was you yeah. for... <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Leanne. Um, yeah, and so again, as I said, they're tiny, but they're very luscious. They're very high in nutrients. They, they're one of those essential foods that uh, we still continue to live on today. And, you know, for my whole life, I've told people that uh, with everything that Indigenous people have lost uh, here on the West Coast, we're still eating our berries and we're still eating salmon. Um, sadly, our salmon are disappearing pretty fast. So pretty soon it might be only our berries we're eating that are from our traditional foods. And uh, so everything we do is important and everything we can do to protect the salmon, which I think looking at projects what, like Wild Bird Trust and working on an entire environmental strategy piece to protect those lands and waters on the waterfront, the shoreline, uh, everything is interconnected. And even these berries, you know, are fed by shells that are dropped by birds. Um, you know, our best caretakers of mother nature is uh, the natural world and the creatures out there. Certainly not humans, we're just destruction mobiles and we have to learn to walk more softly in the environment and to care for these beautiful plants and um, and treasure them and getting to know them and their personalities is a really big thing. When are the huckleberries ready? Well, it's uh, always starts with the bees, you know, and for these ones, they're traditionally from high mountains. So they uh, their normal availability would be August because these ones are growing down uh, near the ocean and it's quite a bit more mild, but it's also kind of cooler. So you got on the high mountain, it, it's cold, 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 and then it's really hot for two months. So <laughs> in Vancouver and in this region, it's like hot and cold, hot and cold, hot and cold. So, uh, but technically we start to see those berries ripen in July. So about a month earlier, it's always about three weeks earlier on, on um, ocean level than uh, compared to mountain level. And that's the same with other berries. Uh, one year, I actually traveled up to Haida Gwaii in August. And this is a good example. So the red huckleberries, which we'll feature in another plant profile later on. Um, you know, I had been picking huckle red huckleberries in Vancouver in June and July, and then they were gone the beginning of July. Then I went up mid to late August to Haida Gwaii and they were abundant and everywhere. So it, it does actually depend on where you are. And, um, you know, the farther up the coast, the further into the season that they start to ripen. So again, we're, we're pretty spoiled here on uh, this area of the coast and farther south as well, like in Washington state. So it depends, again, you have to kind of keep an eye 
on what the weather's been in different places. When we've had colder springs and um, cooler summers, it, they, they'll ripen later. So, um, you know, the way that I see the berry timeline for Vancouver is we get the salmon berries first and those happen by mid to late May. Um, then we get uh, strawberries, then we start to see the huckleberry uh, blossoms coming out in June. And then by July, we start to get, um, yeah, as Carleen said, less and less uh, red huckleberries are showing up. And that's really because people are, are not understanding and recognizing the, the features of plants in the fall and winter and early spring. And they, uh, especially people that work in parks, they start to just, you know, take down salmonberry bushes and uh, the red huckleberries. And, you know, like for my arm length, I've got a regular arm length. It's not very long, but that is about 10 to 12 years growth of a red huckleberry. So things grow really slow. And these black huckleberries are even slower because they're used to growing up high in the mountains. They're used to high winds and snow, like extreme mountain temperatures up there. So they don't grow fast and they don't grow tall. It takes that like, there are some of these plants outside of the Native Education College in East Vancouver. And they're about my height, but they've been growing there 50 years. So they're a very slow growing, low growing plant. They're, they're a low shrub. They're not a big tree like, um, like sea berries or uh, Saskatoon berries, those things like they, they grow big, fast, but these are tiny shrubs that are literally very tiny and take a long time to grow. And, um, you know, and and they have certain characteristics like this. This photo that is showing here is a really good one because you really see the structure of the leaves. In this one, they're very crisp. They're evergreen. They stay green all year round. The red huckleberries lose their leaves. That's why people don't know what they are. They don't know how to identify them. On my um, more interactive walks with people one to one where I have you know a group of people I make everybody touch and feel all the plants and talk to them and feel the the textures of their branches because uh, the red huckleberry is, is completely different than this one which we'll see when I, I'm waiting for that one till it gets warmer and more leaves start to pop up and we start to see more formation the ones outside of the wild bird trust have little red buds coming out so it's new growth coming and um, eventually we'll start to see some flowers budding. Uh, one of the things I love though is that we um, you know the plants okay I can't tell where I am in the screen if I'm in there. I want to show something with my hand so yeah. maybe we'll go off the this for a second. Yeah. Sounds good. And then I can kind of so like imagine a flower in this shape, like it's like a ball with a very tiny opening. And so that's what a lot of the berry plants, but specifically vacciniums have these like, like very round uh, buds that are like so tiny. They're like this, you know, here we go up to my glasses here. So tiny finger to finger. And then just the tiniest little opening, right? Uh, that that you either have to be a tiny insect to get in there, or as the bumblebees like to do, they, they just bumble and they buzz and they vibrate. And through that action, it's known as buzz pollination. And so through their like just hanging around, you might think, well, they're not even touching those because they don't have to. They're such Jedi masters, they're ninjas. They just, they just dance around. And then the pollen shakes on them like a little shower and then they go to the next one and then they kind of buzz in there and they shake the pollen back up inside of the next one. So this is the work of pollinators. And I really can't say enough uh, important facts about pollinators. So uh, as human beings, if we had to take over that job for one thing, getting into these places to do that without destroying habitats of salamanders and other wild 
uh, pollinators, we would destroy things for one thing. For another thing, it would take, we would need three hands. We'd need to carry a dish, a little Petri dish, a paintbrush, and a, you're gonna love this, a tooth, a, an electric toothbrush that vibrates and creates that buzz energy and the shaking to get the pollen to fall into the dish and then paint it and go to another flower and get up inside and paint it. So in a bumblebee's life, which is 53 days, and it, you know, and for honeybees, 35 days, they pollinate uh, up to 2 million bear, uh, flowers each. each. Each bee does up to 2 million. So if you ever wonder why all, what's all the fuss about these bees? Why do we have to care about them? I'm allergic to them. I don't like them. Do you like blueberries? Do you like huckleberries? <laughs> That's what it takes. So, um, you know, you like a lot of our fears around things that we're uh, sensitive to are what inhibit us from uh, understanding and learning the importance of that that web of the, of the natural world and the importance of what all of these little creatures do to thrive and help us survive. And it's the most selfless work on the planet because they just do it. And yes, they gather pollen and they bring some things home, but most of their work is for the birds and the humans and the bears and other creatures that eat wild berries. So um, it's, it's a really big sacrifice that those little creatures <clears throat> make. And it's, you know, it's nothing for us to take more time and to be gentle in the forest. Uh, also to note, if you were to break a red huckleberry bush just to eat five berries off of it, you're killing about five to 10 years growth you could also be fined up to five or $10,000 every time you do that. Mm -hmm. And I was told that by a park ranger when I worked with uh, To Slay With Tooth at their Takaya Tours booth in uh, Tum Tum Waiten or Belcara Picnic Area. And so, yeah, <clears throat> these are important things. I often have to tell kids to stop breaking those branches because they'll be like, but I just want to eat one. It's like, yeah, and like imagine, you know, you're five years old and your life would be gone because someone picked you up. Like it's that, it's that delicate. We have to really respect nature and we have to think about, you know, what is five years of our life? What happens in five years of our lives? Um, that could be the whole life of a berry, a berry plant. And also to note that huckleberries do not produce berries until they're over seven years old. Wow. So we really, you know, we really have to take care of things out there. Like a five-year-old plant could be this big or, you know, I've seen little one-year-olds this big and then, yeah, I guess five years old might be about like this much. So these are the things that we, we have to do. And I'm thanking Carlene for noting that, like our grandparents told us, don't break the branches. It's really harmful and it's unnecessary, you know? Um, it, there's no there's no rhyme or reason why people do that they just do it because uh they want to or they're lazy but it, these are the things we really have to the reason i do the work i do is to create stewards with every, everybody that listens in i want people to take it seriously and i want them to call people out that are doing this stuff in the forest because when you realize how long it takes for that little plant to grow and develop and create food, and even if it's not for us, but it's for the natural world, we need to let it do its thing and we need to let it live its life cycle. And I really think it's about time humans stopped uh, making up excuses about, oh, well, it's just one bush, okay. So there's a couple million people in Vancouver and if half the population decides to break these, there'll be no more huckleberries. It's, it happens that fast, really does. Everything we do has a repercussion. So yeah. So that um, work is, is totally on saving these plants and saving the environment, yeah. Thank you so much, Lise. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Um, I was just gonna say that it's so true. And I think that uh, maybe if you could talk a few minutes before we open up for questions um, on the ethics of foraging, right? Because um, especially on conservation land, um, it, it's important to know that 
um, yeah, you can't just go and, and, and take everything. Plants aren't just there for us. They're there for Mother Earth first. They're there for the plant, uh, other plants and other animals. And then they're there for us last, right? So um, it's about respecting the plant and its, um, and its purpose there, not just to benefit us, right? Um, so I don't know if you could talk maybe uh, two to three minutes on that if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, well... Anything we take from nature, we have to give something back. And that's uh, definitely a strong indigenous principle that we, all of our, all nations practice that reciprocity, even if they don't even know what that word is, if they've never even heard the word reciprocity, they know what the action is. It's about paying forward and it's about returning. You know, maybe you don't, maybe somebody helps you and you don't get to help them back because they maybe don't need it, but you help the next person you see that needs help. And that's the same with the natural world. We can't just say, oh, everything's free because I see these foragers. I never use the word foraging because it gets associated with hipsters that are like, oh, I just got 10 basketfuls of like chanterelles and you know, some lobster mushrooms and turkey tails. Oh my God, I'm gonna go back tomorrow and get even more. And it's like, okay, <laughs> well, like, you know, I'm, I, I also get annoyed with people telling me that I'm shaming people when I call that stuff out because not everybody understands even how to pick stuff without leaving spores in the ground. They take the whole thing, they disrupt the, the network. So it's always about, you know, I always, I run a tea business and when I'm gathering, I think about, you know, the work I'm doing and I try to not over uh, gather, over harvest from areas. And I go to many areas to harvest. So people say, for instance, where did you get your Labrador tea? And sometimes I actually will do trades with people in different communities and send them stuff from here that I have a bunch of and, or make teas and send them a bunch of teas and then I get a package from them of you know Labrador tea or something so you know it comes from different parts of the coast um, local areas here out in Richmond where I'm able to go and gather in certain places and but I'm always you know those ones I I tend to gather myself or uh, in pre-COVID days I would travel places up the coast and and uh, bring things to trade and, uh, and then gather stuff, but also share it with the community. So it's, uh, it's always about our personal ethics. And on that note, ethics aren't just about what you do for the environment. It's about thinking about the, the indigenous people in the area and asking permissions to be on the land to do that gathering. And I've been harassed about calling that stuff out, but I don't care, like it's, that's what I've done. I do walk that walk and I do talk that talk and I don't mess around with it because it, you know, doesn't matter if nobody, you think nobody's watching, the ancestors are always watching and you will be called out at some point, whether it's through dreams or through your elders. So, you know, just enough with excuses. I don't know where to find native people. Oh my God, they're everywhere. We're all over the place. <laughs> like we work in public spaces with, you know, and I did a talk with the Dandelion uh, Herbal Conference in Olympia, Washington about five years ago. And so all those excuses came out in the room full of a hundred people. There were only three people and they were all indigenous who went to indigenous people to ask permissions to, to gather on the land and in the states they arrest people if you can't just go in a park like we can here and in, in big provincial parks like we can't go to the local regional parks and pick but you know it's it's intense down there and so all the excuses came out and I said well I just drove from the border and I think there was like seven different signs in different areas Lummi Nation you know Nisqually Nation <laughs> like they're on the highway, they're massive signs, you can't miss them. And so, you know, those, like we're here and we're uh, approachable and the excuses are, are just laziness. It, it just comes down to, do you really want to learn about the environment? If, you're, if you really don't care, then go to Costco and buy the stolen 
uh, wild blueberries that some somebody who wasn't indigenous picked for a company and sold it to you. Go ahead, because you're no better than that if you're just taking and not giving something back. Another way of doing it is being involved in programs like Wild Bird Trust in your community, finding places you can help to uh, to put plants in the land. I have a friend that last year I gave a few berry bushes to, and then her and her partner uh, go for walks in their neighborhood and they started to notice this little park forest that was getting overrun with invasive. So they started working on it. They went to their local city district and talked about it and the district donated them all the plants they asked for and they planted them into the forest. So. There are different ways to practice reciprocity and invasive pulling is very important. It saves a bunch of plants. It saves a bunch of animals. Doing it right is important. If you take out a huge chunk of, of Himalayan blackberry, you can't just go in and slice it with the machine because birds are nesting in there and you could displace uh, animals and also kill their, their eggs, you know? So uh, thinking about all of these things takes a lot of, pre-planning and studying the sites that you're going to remediate and uh, and working with the environment itself, as well as your local districts. And if you see a problem, deal with it. Don't wait for somebody else. And uh, I, I've also wandered around in parks. Last year during COVID, I was by myself a lot and I took care of my daughter's dog quite a bit. So we went to parks and there was one where I just started remediating the whole stream. It was so covered in, in bush that had uh, fallen down from hemlock uh, branches and stuff and, and other windfalls. So I started clearing the bush. And one of the days I was there and I had just got the water streaming into an area where it was just mud and the water started to flow. Well, my reward was a fantastic reward. A hummingbird appeared and it was just dancing over the water. It was like it was mesmerized that there was water moving there when there hadn't been. And so that was my reward. I got so much and, you know, I spent an hour in there mucky and pulling things out and probably falling down a few times and, you know, but it was so worth it. And, you know, I kept going back and checking it. And uh, then on Mother's Day, I was by myself and in that same forest and it's in, a, in the West Van district. And somebody had decided to make a pipe probably for marijuana and they dropped it because it was too hot and uh, it had coals in it and they walked away. And by the time I came along, it's probably a couple hours later, it had started uh, smoldering in the, in the dried leaves in May. And, you know, we thought it was really wet last year, but inside of these forests, it's damp uh, sometimes, but it's often dry because of climate change. And so the fire had gone up inside a, a fallen cedar log that was pointed right towards a whole bunch of houses. And it would have taken an hour once that log got uh, a good fire going, and it would have taken out probably five houses right there that were all along the edge of this little forest. So I was really relieved and I had to try to get people's attention when people didn't want to be near each other, but I made it happen. I was determined. Um, I, uh, because I was with my daughter's dog, I forgot my phone. I couldn't phone um, 911, but I convinced a, a neighbor that was trimming their hedge to come and look at what was going on. So, you know, they were, they were intimidated by me. Who's this lady that wants me to go in the forest with her alone? Like, I'm like bring your family. I don't care. I'm by myself like with a dog. <laughs> There's other people here, but nobody's paying attention. And, but it was actually uh, Luna, the husky that had noticed the smoke and was getting really agitated because I thought it was just misty. But then when I got closer, I was like, I can smell it. So, you know, there are different things that we can do that are reciprocal, like, Adopt a little zone around your neighborhood that you see is in trouble and think about the ways that you could contribute to putting more plants in there. Even if it's just about putting more plants in there, that's gonna help remediate the site. Help our bird friends, help our bees. These are all our big focus with everything that we do on this site at Wild Bird Trust, Maplewood Flats. It's all about saving little creatures because they are the ones taking care of us. 
And any of us can go back into our, um, wherever you're from, indigenous or not, look into your creation stories and see that the big link of survival has always been animals. Even the smallest creatures have helped big populations thrive and survive. So I think it's time for humans to, you know, put on our big people pants and, and start doing that work and take it seriously. Uh, you want to enjoy your time walking through the forest. Don't just take it for granted. Think about what you can give back. You want to pick some berries, make sure you always put a few back, throw them into the forest because they'll just rot and the seeds will grow new plants. You can't just take, you have to give something back. There always has to be an offering. It's not just about putting tobacco down. It's about putting back the life that's gonna keep thriving and think about your next seven generations, at least, at least. Nice. Yeah, I love that. And taking only what you need, right? Like, yeah, um, yeah. I, I've i been it's like kind of stewarding this um, nettle patch that was near my house that I thought was unknown to others um for years now maybe three or four years and this past year I went to go um harvest some of the new uh leaves that come for for tea and I only take a few every year just what I need and unfortunately the entire nettle plant was ripped out or it wasn't it, like the tops were all ripped off and mm -hmm. The plant was pretty much it, it didn't look like someone had mowed it it looked like someone had just come in and and picked like a bunch and it was so sad because I'm like you know I, I don't think of this as my um plant but I do think of this as a plant for all of the nature around me and the fact yeah. that you, someone just came in and took all of it but you know and not considering other people and or animals and you know plants that might need that so it yeah. is it's pretty upsetting. Um, but I, I do want to maybe uh, spend the next five minutes um, on questions if anyone has any, because Cece, you're just such a, um, an amazing um, speaker and you have so much knowledge and we really appreciate you sharing this. So if anyone does have any questions, um, uh, definitely either write in the chat or you can unmute yourself. If you don't know how to unmute yourself, it's on the lower left-hand side of your computer. Um, if you're in the Zoom app um, on your computer, you just um, you wiggle your mouse and you'll see it says unmute. Um, and you can unmute yourself and ask. And if not, oh, I see uh, Christy, um, you have your hand up, so I'll unmute you. Let's see if it works. <laughs> Oh, Christy, you can also write in the chat too. I don't know if you had your hand up on purpose, but um, definitely let us know if you want to say anything. Um, all right. Yeah, but if anyone has any questions. Um, oh, I think it just picked up the sound of a washing machine. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, but Christy, if you do have a question, let us know. You can either write it in the chat or not. Um, but yes, um, Cease, I, I really appreciate you um, taking that time. Um, and yeah, and talking to us about all of these. Oh, it looks like there's something in the chat. Uh, so, book, yeah, book so everybody has a book for me. I don't have a book. <laughs> I'm, I'm walking a book right now, but I don't know. I think there's a lot of people doing books. So I, I just, um, there's a lot of amazing people doing stuff with plants. And one of the people that I think is really cool is uh, Christy Belcourt did a really fabulous, uh, it's a multi-layer, multidisciplinary piece about plants. Uh, and it focuses on beading. And um, she gives beading templates and teachings for each of the plants. And then she's done a plant uh, knowledge book. But I do think that uh, it's something that Sanakula, my daughter and I really wanna work on getting a book together. And what's this one? There's a question here, I'm gonna read it off. Uh, do you ask people not to take plants? Yes, we ask people to not gather from the uh, Maplewood Flats for the specific reason that it's a giant bird feeder. <laughs> it is a giant pollinator and bird feeder site. And we have so many other places to go and people are like, yeah, but it's so easy to get it here. Yeah, but it's not supposed to be easy for you. Easy for you to see and observe, but 
you know, there have been people that have removed moss for their moss bags, uh, moss uh, baskets where they're growing mostly non-indigenous flowers, I want to say, <laughs> and stealing that, essentially stealing it from the site right in front of people. And it's, they're very bold, but uh, that's going to start meeting fines and it's going to start, you're going to be called out. So don't pick stuff from the site because it is a giant bird feeder and it's a learning environment. Um, it's just like a, a dear friend of mine who made his journey to the spirit world years ago, Mike McDonald spent um, a few years of his life traveling across the country and planting, installing butterfly gardens. And he did this to save the butterflies, not people. <laughs> we got lots of ways to be saved, but you know, people wanted to gather stuff off the site. And it was like, no, he said, as he put it, this is an art installation and you don't touch the art. So it's the same on the Wild Bird Trust site at Maplewood Flats. We don't gather things there just because they're easy to reach. We don't do that because it's a giant bird feeder. It's a pollinator ground. It is there for nature. And we do as humans need to stop being human centric and this whole age of the Anthropocene where it's all about us. We need to take a step back and we need to allow these small creatures to have their place to gather. You know, when we take from them, that's food they're not accessing. So, you know, everything there is a demonstration. It's there for us to look at and learn from. And- uh, My apologies, I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, sorry, my phone is, my phone didn't hear me watch was like I can't hear you I can't hear you I thought it was somebody on here I'm like what do you mean you can't hear me <laughs> anyway I do hope I don't I don't mean to sound like the like calling people out but I kind of I feel like I have to add that that kind of critical feedback to people because we do always find some like part of ourselves that is like but but why not me and it's like, this is a site that is dedicated to birds, not to people. <laughs> and um, it's also why people aren't allowed to walk their dogs down there. There are all kinds of reasons that, you know, like we have so many places that we can go. We can't, but we can't get upset about places that are focused on healing for other creatures other than ourselves and, and become essentially whiny about it. Well, but I like to do that here. Well, you have a whole coast that you can go on, <laughs> several beaches, exactly. so many places you can go, so many forests. And, you know, like my community, we grew a food forest. We started, it took about 10 years for it to get into a shade canopy setup, but it also took that long for some of them to produce berries. And in the meantime, we had, we could go shopping and buy foods that we needed, or we could trade with other people. So we have to, we have to really humble ourselves about the environment. And if we want a certain amount of berries every year, then don't expect to get it in the forest, grow it in your yard, start a community food forest with people. If you live in an apartment building and can't have a yard access, there are so many ways that we can do that. Convince your building to allow you to start a food forest on your rooftop, then you're feeding the birds and the bees as well. You're helping migratory birds. Everything we do saves these little things that are saving our lives. By saving that site, we save ourselves. And it's a really positive way to critique our own interactions and interventions with the natural world around us. So yeah. Any more? Any I think more that's, I mean, um, Carlene did leave a very beautiful uh, message in the chat if you want to go read that. Um, oh, I love her. Thank Carly. you, Carly. Awesome. That's so sweet. And I appreciate that. And I want to say that I've also had to have those teachings. I'm, I'm not sharing anything with anybody that hasn't been shared with me. And I've been you know, called out when I was younger and didn't understand things. Yeah, I tree planted and destroyed things I shouldn't have. I had to learn the hard way. I've, I've done all that. And that's why I'm very protective of the environment and all environments I travel through. So um, big love to each and every one of you. Um, I saw Pamela Chris John is here. I really hope that I can connect with you. 
I don't know how to find you. So <laughs> um, yes, I don't see you, but I'm imagining your beautiful face, Pamela, and sending you lots of love and think of you often. Yeah, so uh, good to have people weighing in from different parts of the country and um, from wherever you are, we send you love and we hope that that this uh, monthly check-in is helpful and entertaining, <laughs> but mostly informative. So, yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Cece. Yes, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, your time, your wisdom with us. I really appreciate it. I feel like I learned something every time. And um, to everyone watching, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, and yeah, hi, Carleen. <laughs> thank you so much. Come to fly, Carlene. I love you. Love you and too. So hey, Elwish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, awesome. and just a, a reminder that well, there's another event this Thursday night that Cease will be joining, uh, talking about what to start thinking about growing or already, you know, putting seeds in some soil and and getting them to sprout. So. Awesome. That, um, yeah. Nicole, Nicole will include a link to that Yay. event in Yay. your, in your um, emails. <laughs> yeah, so start getting, um, you know, if for those of you wanting to grow Indigenous plants from seed, you can go, you can ask us at the flats. You can also go to Van Dusen Gardens. They have a great seed store, as well as the UBC Botanical Gardens also have these uh, indigenous berry seeds that you can start, but just know it's gonna be a labor of love at least 10 years, <laughs> you're really getting that that you're growing, but don't make that, don't let that stop you. You're paying it forward for the next generation. So, exactly. Osea, Hi, awesome. thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming. Bye everyone.